Hi, I'm Elysia Buss with Horsepower Empowerment Through Connection here today with Cam Salem, who is the founder of Horses Teaching and Healing located in Knoxville, Tennessee. She works um, at English Mountain Recovery Center, helping people with horses through addiction recovery of drugs and alcohol. She has been in the field, you guys, for 22 years. Oh my gosh, the wealth of knowledge that this woman has to offer us today is just like mind blowing. I feel so lucky to get to be here today with Pam and share this like incredible information for like with you today. Pam, thank you so much for being here. Happy to be here, Alicia. Thank you. So can you tell us a little bit more about like, how, how did you get started in um, working with horses? Like what was your why, what pulled you in? Well, I'd always been a rider and a competitor and um, I, I had always known that horses could help people. And my idea in the beginning was that I had a friend doing a path center in Knoxville and that I was going to go and volunteer at her place with the kids that had behavioral issues. Right. And that was going to be my give back for what horses had given me. Okay. That was, that was my idea. That makes sense. Um, so I kept, checking in with her and in 1998 I called her and I said Lynn what are you going to do the kids you used to do and she said Pam she said I have a hundred clients I have a year's waiting list and they've sold this farm and I'm going to have to move again and so you're going to have to do this and I said what what that was never, ever my plan. Um, <laughs> Funny how the universe happens. answers things like that. Life is what happens when you're making other plans. So, <laughs> That's right. Dad loved that um, song. Yeah. So um, I got online and I looked and there, were, there was one page on Google and it had two hits. One was Equine Services, which became Egala, and one was... Um, a path training um, at Horsepower, which was Boo McDaniel's farm in New Hampshire. So I, I couldn't arrange to go to New Hampshire, but then I checked in and eventually EGALA formed in 99. And I went to my first training at Virginia Intermont, which is close to Tennessee. And that was in October of 99. Prior to that, <laughs> I got a grant from the Presbytery. <laughs> in, uh, you know, the Presbyterian Church, Presbytery. And I went to Arizona and studied with a person there that had a place called Tucson Animal Assisted Psychotherapy Associates. Who was that again? And it's no longer uh, in operation, but it was called Tucson Animal Assisted Psychotherapy Associates. And it, the acronym was TAPA, T-A-A-P-A. -A -A. That had a, a significance in India. Anyway, it, it, was, it was very foundational to go there. Uh, she was a former nun, and we just really hit it off. So um, it was quite inspiring to see what she was doing. And um, then I came home and found, you know, that Egala was forming and got in on that and got in on the training and went to that training. And I guess I was just ready and I never looked back. That's so um, cool. I went, I called my friends in Spiritual Frontiers. I asked them to come out so I could practice on them. My brother's an occupational therapist and he came out and I just never looked back. Uh, and nobody had ever heard of it. Yeah, no, it's, it's super new. I mean, I remember graduating from high school in 1998 and wanting to work with horses. And I remember that PATH was super new back then, but there just wasn't really a lot in the field at that time. I think Prescott college opened up their programs um, roughly about that time for the equine assisted learning and mental health. Do you remember hearing about them back then? 
not that long ago. It was, um, you know, I, I, I know. I, I don't remember hearing about them until the 2000s. Yeah. I know. Uh, they may have been doing things because, of course, Barbara Rector was doing things in Tucson. Right. And, and so she was instrumental in the field. And um, so um, they well may have been working with her. And I, you know, I'm on the other side of the country. And, and right. You know, You're just like, I'm in Tennessee. <laughs> yeah, you know. So, um, so I just kind of stumbled along um, and I remember going to Equine Affair and a gala had sent out a newsletter and I got them to send me a whole bunch of newsletters and I went to Equine Affair and I think, I can't remember where it was, whether it was Ohio or Kentucky, but anyway, I went and I handed out I just would walk up to people and hand them out this, this newsletter. <laughs> You're like, this is amazing. You've got to do this. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I met a lot of people that way and, <laughs> and, and just started, started networking. And so then the next year I hosted an Egala training oh, and met cool. a therapist and started working with her. Um, that was 2000 in October. And, so, and then I met another lady in 2003 who was a therapist and we worked together until 2009. So nice. um, we did her clients plus workshops that we did. Um, and what did, the, uh, what did the workshops focus around? Can you um, let people know like some of the different populations that you're able to work with to help the horses? Yes, um, the population that she worked with were women in transition primarily. We had some youth. Um, my interest was always the youth getting them before they wound up at the recovery center. Right. Um, but I wound up um, working with her. And then when she retired her license, I, I worked at English Mountain from then on. I've been there going on 11 years now. Um, so the population I've worked with has been people um, in recovery and, and people who were her clients. Uh, but, but primarily women in transition that we did the workshops for. Um, Do you notice that the people that you work with in the addiction center tend to um, recover faster and have less relapses when they work with the horses versus working in standard practice for addiction recovery? They have a dual diagnosis center where I work. So they not only have addiction counselors, they also have um, counselors that help them with any behavioral issues or um, trauma or anything like that. Th there, there's a man named Johan Hari, H-A-R-I, and he has a, a TEDx talk, and he says that the opposite of addiction is not sobriety, it's connection. Mm. Yeah, so, that makes a lot of sense. So what I, I really have based that program on um, as a teacher is teaching them how they can connect with horses and feel that connection and connect with humans and connect with their higher power. That's beautiful. Um, they can't, um, some come there have never had an authentic connection but yeah. you can have the authentic connection with a horse. Absolutely, yes. And um, so there's a, a great article on my website, Horses Teaching and Healing, about Martin Buber, who, when he was 11, had that authentic connection with a horse, and that's what helped him develop his I Thou. Mm. Um, that became just Dalt. So the horse was way back in all of this. And that was something I was taught by Dr. Joanne Moses at Tapa in Arizona. Yeah. She, she led me to that um, passage. And I think it's a very important passage because it's the here and now that horses give us um, that is part of the healing process. It brings Absolutely. people... In. Now, can I say that it, it helps everybody? No. Um, but it is one of the many things at the recovery center 
that they can benefit from and open up and learn how it feels. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's what I love about our field and um, the different things that I'm trying to do with the um, Global Equine Affiliates is to really connect not just with equine therapists, but people all over the world that are positively impacting other people because everybody's different. Like we all have a, a, a different journey, a different storyline that runs through our head and different intelligences and love languages and attachment, you know, like, like attachment theory, right? We all have our different attachments. <laughs> um, and dissociative. And, and there's, there's some work that I have done that it actually changed my life and changed my personality for the better. Um, it was done by a Serbian um, psychologist. He, he developed this. And um, in that work, um, you have the duality and you bring the duality together to neutralize it. <clears throat> so the way people do that and I've watched it happen. I've watched people work and be trained. And it's the words. And they have to use their words. Right. So when they use their words, when we're talking about the horses, that's, that's where they get their answers from and learn how to ask those Socratic questions. And it has to be their words. Because words carry a vibration. Absolutely. And so when it's their words and their language, it's their experience. Mm -hmm. And we are doing experiential work. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, we need to be very aware of the fact that they need their language because it carries the vibration of their experiences. Yeah, and having the right people that they connect with instead of just forcing them into a model that they don't necessarily, and people, practitioners that they don't necessarily align with. Because, I mean, you can have great practitioners that don't align with like you're never going to align with every single person that you meet because every person has a different journey a different way of how they process information and so i think that it's yeah it's really important to take the ego out of our um our line of work because a lot of people they get really fixated on a particular model and they're like this is the end all be all and i always struggle with that a little bit because when once we like close our minds to that like then you're losing out on so much different information that you can learn and expand your range to help more people and we should just be able to support one another and be like hey i can help you for a minute or a year or maybe not at all i'm going to send you down to the road to be helped by this other people because we believe in uh, like seeing the whole person right because we want to facilitate sure. that healing person. And there, there are people that are like me that are eclectic. And, and I think you probably eclectic learners. Yeah, you know, I love eclectic we, learners. We're, we're, my we favorite. Are, are <laughs> and I have things in my toolbox that I have collected from Barbara Rector, from Greg Kirsten and E. Gala, from Lynn Thomas, from all the people that have gone before. And um, so... You know, and I, and I utilize those. Yeah, um, they're all pieces of the but, puzzle. But then there are some people that prefer to stay in a model and build skill. And there's, at, to me, you know, the intellectual rigor of that I admire. And those, you know, that's a person you know that has really worked on a particular model and skill and is good at it. Yeah, because they can go deeper because it's just a singular thing. And I can appreciate yeah. that as so well. That, that's why, I mean, I, I love what you're doing because you you can find those people and they may not be like you and me, but they're very, very good at what they do. And so you can send people, you will just know, oh, I know this person. It's gonna meet, so, that's going to meet them and like that model is going to meet that person. And I guess I shouldn't. It's not right. that I am against people who just commit themselves to one model. It's just when they become closed-minded about that model. Does that make sense? Oh, sure, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because sure. I just, I really, I love like, oh my gosh, I've known a handful of people in my lives that in high school, they knew what they wanted to do for their whole lives. Like my brother's one of those people and I think he's just a phenomenal human being. And, um, and I always kind of envied that. I'm like, man, you like, you knew what you wanted to do and you stuck with it and you just like go like deep, deep, deep into that experience. 
And what a gift that is to people that are so solid inside of themselves that like nothing can shake them from the path that they're supposed to be on. And um, yeah, it's really beautiful. So, you know, I, I think that people that, that are building their skills, uh, one of them I think of is, uh, you know, the, the group doing natural lifemanship. Um, yeah, I love that model. The, the trauma-focused um, equine-assisted psychotherapy. And they build that on, of course, I like it because they build it on connection. Exactly. And we talk a lot about the attachment theory in that particular model as well, which I really resonate with. Um, it talks, you know, like childhood wounds and reprogramming and yeah, all sorts of things. So because I really believe the connection with the horse is what's very healing. Absolutely. Um, uh, in, in ways we probably don't even know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, constantly yeah. expanding. <laughs> And speaking of ways that we don't even know, can you talk to me a little bit about the science behind the work that we do? I know there's a lot I, there that you probably have to like flip through the Rolodex. And like, which one did I? <laughs> well, that that is one of the things that I I like about um, you know about the association about about EGALA, about natural lifemanship. I mean, natural lifemanship built um, their training on Dr. Bruce Perry's neurosequential model. And so, you know, I like the way that the field is going now with building upon the scientific rigor and adding the horse in and adding yeah. in the horse knowledge, you know, the knowledge of the horse. Yeah. Because, sentient being. Um, you know, that people that really understand horses have always been able to help people. Um, <laughs> so, you know, that's nothing new. I knew some old time horse people when I was growing up and I'm old now. And I, <laughs> I've, I've lived a long time and I've seen people that helped others that were because they were simply wise. Yeah. And, yeah, and some people just have innate wisdom. You know, yeah. it, and, and, you know, long ago, there were the wise women. Yeah. And they did not have things behind their names, letters. They were just the wise women. It's true. And, um, and we've kind of moved away from that yeah. a little. Um, I feel like we're coming back like a little bit, like slowly but surely. It's coming back. Yeah, I do too. I do too. And, um, but, I, you know, I think we're very fortunate because we do have, um, the intellectual rigor of study now that we can figure out why some things work and some things don't. Yeah. Uh, More longitudinal studies and mixed methodology. It's uh, qualitative and quantitative. Yeah. Like it's just fantastic. And then you've got the horse math that like Shannon Knapp is really focusing on at the horse sense of the Carolinas and how that's kind of being integrated more into different programs around the U S and it's, uh, it's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Shannon, Shannon found the horse math book on my table and the girl that was working with her back then snatched it up and went, wow. They had come over to my house for a meet, a networking meeting and I had yeah. all my, like you have your books out, I had all my books out on the table and, and the girl Lynn that was working with her then said, what's this? You know, and so, <laughs> so way back then, you know, we were all excited about heart math. And, yeah, uh, it's so cool. I love it. I love the congruence. And, and Shannon's just taking it and run with it uh, over there. Fabulous, She's only yeah. about an hour and a half away from where I am. So uh, I, I get to go over there. Um, oh, that's so cool. And I've been enjoying, I've been enjoying her, uh, her Zoom webinars yes. during this time. Zoom has been fun. But also, um, you asked me about, all the different things that are going on with our work. Yeah. You know, I was one of the founding members of the Equine Experiential Education ah, Association because cool. a lady called me up and, and said, you know, I worked in the corporate world and I think, I think we need an association for people that just do that because that's different from therapy. Mm -hmm. So they wound up at my house for 10 days and 
we did a training and we had an actual client come out and um, so it had just evolved because I knew as a business person that therapy would be too intrusive for a corporate group, that it needed to be a different kind of model. Yeah, so, absolutely. Um, you know, and then, you know, so they, they developed their model and then we started having coaching and actually the therapist that I worked with for seven years uh, retired her uh, psychology. She was a PhD psychologist and, and chose to then become a coach. That's perfect. And, yeah. Um, it's a really nice transition so, point. You know, so when I started out, we had one page with two hits, right? Right. <laughs> now there's a lovely lady that has compiled and the la the list was done in 2018 and I think it's being updated now. 18 pages of trainings available. Holy wow. I so, have no idea. That's like mind blowing. That's so awesome. That makes my heart so happy to hear that there are so many different modalities out there. I'm like so many different ways to help people. Yeah. So fantastic. Um, so Sorry for the barking dog, guys, if you can hear that in the background. She's just really excited to guard the house. Yeah. <laughs> God will show up because mine will be barking. Um, so um, I think it's one of the things that I, I had planned to do this year, which, you know, obviously we all got shut down. Right. Um, that, that I still want to do is a training for people um, who either want to jumpstart what they're doing or people entering the field who would like to get a handle on who they really want to serve and what that looks like. And you hear that, so, ladies and gentlemen, go talk to what, Pam Salem in, in Knoxville, Tennessee. She's going to rock your world and get, like, get you going in your businesses. Because I have my friend that has done the coaching and she was also a member of the uh, E3A at one time and she now has EAL Academy and um, so uh, you know she's close to me then I have a grief center close to me that does the Agala model I have a past center close to me and so um, my my plan is to have you know people come and we will discuss their dreams and put some foundations under them. Fantastic. Um, so that's because if you look at 18 pages, you become overwhelmed. Oh uh, yeah. Else. It's really easy to do. So, you know, you have to begin ident identifying. I mean, I entered the field in 1998, Alicia, it was until 2005 that I went to Debbie Anderson's stride for success before I really understood the difference between EAL and EAP. Yeah, that's, and, that's really interesting. And they have a phenomenal program up there at Strides for Success, how they've it's, integrated it's fabulous. learning um, into the schools and their marvelous mini program right. and Blair McKissick's up there, like her and Debbie are just like that and how they've created that program. And it's just so, so phenomenal. Debbie, yeah, Debbie was the one that told me, she said, um, actually it was um, the gal that worked with her at the time, Linda, she said, Pam, think of it this way, EAP, is about the issue with EAL is about the principle and yeah, so we actually have one of their books right here if you saw this hey look oh uh, great this. yeah they, they, they one of their books right for success right here great curriculum think that is great curriculum. Much information yeah <laughs> um so they at the school program which is what I went to learn about at the time um, she said, we have a word of the day. So instead of taking it back to the, how do you feel and all these things right. that therapists do, she said, we take it back to the word of the day. The word of the day. So, you know, I thought that was a great simple explanation for the difference between EAP and EAL. Um, yeah, no. The issue and ones, and, and there are people trained in all of those things. Absolutely. Like, yeah. So, 
so where, you know, what assets do you bring already to the horse work? Um, and, you know, what kind of experience do you have with horses? If you don't, then, uh, but you love them, then you can find somebody to partner with that does have that experience. Yeah, and we have ethical parameters too. Like Alva has really strict ethical uh, parameters for their program, don't they? If I'm remembering correctly. Who? Egala. Egala. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, with the psychotherapy and everything like that, and the like various levels. But there's actually a lot right. of um. Because you you want to yeah. Within uh, the sphere of competence that you have. Absolutely. Yeah, it's really important to not cross that line. And I appreciate how when you work, um, some of the different models work with an equine specialist and then they have a mental health provider. And I like it when you get to work as an equine assisted learning practitioner and then having a mental health therapist there too, because sometimes you hit on points that people get triggered and then you can just like shift right on over to the mental health provider to get to have them dive deeper into that particular thing that needs to be addressed. And if you don't have a mental health provider that's there and somebody gets triggered, it's really important to already have like a set network of mental health providers that you can exactly. then like refer people to, um, to get the help that they need. So they don't have to stay in that triggered um, place in case that's like out of your scope of practice to help them with those particular issues that they're coming across. It's also very wise to get training if you're going to do the learning aspect and the corporate aspect and all of that to learn if you get into that little rabbit hole how to get out of it oh i completely agree yeah how and, to like and triage and experience to, so everybody says that's what they train you to do in e3a and in eal academy you know they'll take you down the rabbit hole but then they'll teach you how to get out that's so very that's, smart. A, that's important to know how to do so that you close that right up and then if people are still triggered, yes, you need to have a network to refer them to. Yeah, very, and I love very how, good point. I love how Shannon um, brought up on one of her calls um, that there's mental health first aid um, to identify when people have suicidal tendencies and how to help them get through that and then get to the people that they need to talk to to um, for counselors and so on and so forth. Because before that um, Zoom call that Shannon had put forth, I had never actually heard of mental health first aid. And I think that with everything going on in the world from the pandemic and people being more in a fear state and all the uncertainty that it's more important like now than ever that people start to become versed in that mental health first aid. Absolutely, absolutely. And it's, it's very confusing when you get training to find out, you know, what training do I really need for the population I really want to serve? Right. That's a really excellent point. And then as a business person, how do I determine in my community what is needed? You know, is that needed in my community or is what I want to do needed somewhere else? So I'm going to have to go there. Yeah. Um, as a business owner uh, and being in the field for so long, what would you say would be some of the key people that you would want in an organization when you're first creating um, your business to avoid so like that, hit? So when you create your organization, there are certain pitfalls that oftentimes occur, especially for startups and people have these giant dreams and horses are very expensive um sentient being to get to partner with you know and uh, it's really easy because like a lot of equine professionals especially i feel like we have these giant hearts right both for the people that we're trying to help and the horses and a lot of people link rescuing horses in with the work that they do and there are a lot of different variables that go into working with rescued horses to um honor the process of their recovery and not getting burned out from the people that they're um, working with. So it's important to address like, how do we avoid burnout in our horses and giving them the care that they need for both their bodies and their minds to be able to process that, process that kind of work, right? And for people to not overextend themselves and they like, getting people on your team that help with marketing. Um, how do you um, help have people like, do you get a coach for yourself to help stop your burnout that might happen and make sure that you're doing self-care? 
academy people create that supportive network and hire the appropriate people to make a successful business. I know that was like five questions in one, but, <laughs> but I feel like you're understanding what I'm trying to say right now. Right. Yeah. And you, and you do have to build a team. Yeah. Um, I, I always knew that I didn't want to do a nonprofit. That's yeah. why when I first started, my friend is really good at her nonprofit. She's very successful. And I mean, she has a premier past center. Um, I awesome. knew that I wanted to serve, but that I did not want to have the structure of a nonprofit because I'm an entrepreneur. Right. Like and, mine is a social purpose corporation. And so, you know, I mean, you, you had the massage therapy business and so, you know, that was a service business. Yep. <laughs> I, I have, I have a business selling to motels and hotels and in the hospitality industry. For As your side business. And, uh, um, so, you know, I knew that that is where I wanted to be when I started in any kind of horse business. So, um, I, I wanted to be an entrepreneur um, because that's my nature. Sure, that's my yeah. Nature. And, yeah, honor your, you know, who you are. So, you know, I had, I had friends that I went to, like in Spiritual Frontiers, mm -hmm. who did a bunch of different things that came out and worked with me. Um, so you have to have a, build a support system um, of mentors, um, and, and friends who will, uh, help you in the different areas, whether it's marketing or setting up the business. Um, one of the things I think people underutilize, uh, and it's available all over the United States, uh, is the small business administration. Oh, that is so um, true. Yeah. It, and, and so, you know, I mean, there so are so many free services in there, <laughs> so many free services, unbelievable, and so much good advice. Now they may not know about our industry. Yeah, but, it's true. But got setting up, you know, setting up whether it's, you know, going to be an LLC or a corporation or, you know, whatever they can help with that. So those are good mentors to have. Um, and I, yeah. and I would highly recommend, recommend, recommend that um thank you so much for bringing that up that's an excellent uh, point that a lot of people in, in tennessee we have the tennessee small business development uh and and that's a part of uh that whole thing and, and it's through uh, a local uh, junior college and um i i found i found wonderful help there for both of my businesses that's fantastic so yeah that's that's a good place um so you got to line up the therapist, if you're going to have, you know, be a coach, um, you know, you've got to line up the people that can do your marketing. Um, I was just on a call the other night and, you know, one of the things is, um, are, are you trying to do it all? Um, or are you smart enough to find the people that like to do certain things that can help you? Yeah, absolutely. It was interesting having been a medical massage therapist for the last 18 years and billing insurance. Like I, I did everything by myself. I did all the marketing. I did all the events. I did all the massage. I did all the billing. Like I did everything and it was word of mouth. And I was just, I was really lucky because I was, I'm just naturally really talented at giving massage. Like I've been doing it since I was five years old and then professionally for the last 18 years. So building my like word of mouth was a very different experience than like going into life coaching where I'm just like, like, oh, this is so different. And there's like all this social like networking and marketing and what funnily leads, what's that? And like, how do we get all this technology to work in the middle of COVID for interviews and all of these things that I'm not good at? And like, so like getting some research and be like, how do you find the right life coach and the right business coach? And like, what part of your team? And how do you do X and Y and Z? And uh, it's two very different business models and getting to just honor the process. And even though you don't um, necessarily have a lot of money on the front end, you just have to get really creative and um, understand that the value of what another person is providing you as a business coach or a life coach is so high 
to like transition from no money to like a lot of money because you have a like a high value product that you get to give people and you just have to like bridge that gap of all the things that you don't know you know it's just you just have to it's figure a, it's out it's an a investment way. of time and money yeah it's an investment in time and money and a lot of people i feel like struggle with like that self-worth point of, piece of it right like well why why would somebody pay me that kind of money like what do i really deserve to have that kind of money like there's lots of different inner like tapes that people struggle with that um it's so important to be able to transcend so that they can invest in themselves. I mean, how many people go on vacation and you spend thousands of dollars like on plane fare, on food, on hotel, on transportation when you're there to go spend a weekend or a week somewhere. You spend like $2,000, but you don't want to pay somebody like $250 to have a life coaching session that can like help you transcend some like ridiculous internal tape that's been self-sabotaging you your whole life and like come on guys <laughs> like how much money like before COVID happened did you spend like going to the bar and like having drinks with your friends like not even being an alcoholic just like casually drinking like that shit's expensive you know or like having really yummy dinners it's so easy to drop like 50 to 100 bucks on like a nice dinner somewhere or entertainment like going out to oh, oh my gosh okay Washington State how much do you guys pay on like for Seahawks tickets? Seahawks tickets. Come on. That's like, I've seen signs out there like a hundred dollars for freaking parking. Stop it. Like you can invest in yourself. Like the games are epic. Don't get me wrong. I love my Seahawks, but come on. <laughs> so it is important to do that. It's also important to give back. Anything that you give back to the universe opens a door. Absolutely. And so I, I have mentored people and helped people without having a set way of doing it. And I have found that when I have freely given, and I don't mean give it away, but when I have freely given in a moment when it's needed, that it always comes back to me in another way. I operate 100% in that same realm. I booked somebody for life coaching today, just in that same sort of concept. And it made my heart so happy and it made them happy. And I know that like, it's just going to come, come full circle. Like I don't worry about it. And it's not like I'm doing this so I can get this. It's just like, no, you do things because it's- I uh, uh, also I think it's important to remember that we have to pay for the warmer and the feed. Yeah, so there's, there's I, a balance. To be I, when I do, <laughs> when I do a group or a session, I expect to be paid for it. So, well, yeah, I mean, a lot um, because of, it has value. It does um, have value, and a lot of people. I mean, I don't know how much board is in your area, but like full care board where I'm at runs on average between like four to six hundred dollars a month for one horse. And that doesn't include your farrier, your veterinary care, your wormer, any supplements your horse needs, the blankets they tear up because horses, the horse blankets are, you know, that's like one to $200 for a horse blanket. And then they tear it up and you have to wash it. You know, like there's so many different factors before you even get to your time <laughs> in your own groceries right. and like car payments and gas or whatever. Um, and, you know, you get the like other four part, horses. The other part of that. It's also what you were talking about, about the mindset. If we are going to have a professional industry, we have to act like professionals. Yeah. And, you know, we, we go out there, we get training. Um, and, and I used to get a little bit exasperated with people that wanted the horse professional to work for less than I could earn teaching a riding lesson. Yeah. So I advise people, okay, if you're a horse professional, how much do you charge for a riding lesson? Are you going to go and pay for all this training and then work for less than you can earn teaching somebody to ride? That's a really excellent point. So um, I think we have to have the self-respect of what we know uh, and you know, and, and walk away when we're not appreciated because if we don't be happy working with that group or that person, um, because we'll never be respected. 
No, it's true. Um, and I'm so glad that you, that you brought up that point. I'm good at what I do. Yeah. And, and, you know, I, I, I am glad to be compensated for it. I'm very glad to serve. I have, you know, I have all my life tried to over deliver. And, um, so, but that doesn't mean I want to undercharge. I just want to do my very best. Yeah. I also, I also remember because I, I wanted to do my best. I was at a, at a meeting, actually it was a hotel motel meeting and the speaker said, uh, and, and I, I, I think I know that this is a quote and I can't remember who said it, but he said, it's not enough to do your very best. You must do that which is required. Yeah, that's you must have you must have your horses clean. You must have your environment safe. Yep. You must have your horses wormed. You must do the right care. And like you said about the rescued horses, you've got to watch out for them and their mentality. Yeah. Um all those things you have to meet the requirements and then you can do your best. Yeah. No, that's, you have so much value that you're giving us right now. Like I so appreciate the time you're taking for our, this interview. It's just solid gold. You guys solid gold. We're so lucky. <laughs> um, so what else would you like to do? <laughs> oh, so many, so many things. Um, so a lot of people right now are struggling with fear and grief and just like uncertainty. So could you speak to some of the things that you've, um, you've experienced in your life that you've overcome and um, been able to have the horses help you and how you, how you were able to hold through that experience? There's a man named David Spangler that says that the background call of the universe is love. And I always knew that the horse's love was very clean. Yes. No agendas. And it was something that I could trust. Yeah. Um, so when I finally realized that I could tap into the love in that universe and that I could trust it, I really never looked back. It's so beautiful. Um, and, and I, and I had some pretty serious times before that. Um, until I remembered it was like, I got here, I lived my life. I screwed up and That's all of a do. sudden, <laughs> all of a sudden I realized, Oh, I forgot the part about the love. I, I haven't been trusting that. And I know, I remember saying to myself, Pam, you know better than that. And that was a moment my life changed. So. You held yourself I've always, accountable. I've, I've, I've always said, you can have it all. You just have to start somewhere. <laughs> right. Um, it's like the, that saying, uh, like, how do you eat an elephant? Like one bite at a time. <laughs> exactly. So. <laughs> I, I knew that I wanted to help people through horses and I started out actually by offering a free, this was long, long before I even found um, the, that those two websites on Google. This was back in the early nineties. So I invited some children from safe space to come to my house. Oh, that's really beautiful. And so they came out and frankly, at that time, I, we had some financial issues and my house was not anywhere near perfect. And I, I felt a little bit, um, I, I, I really didn't want anybody to come in, but it rained. So here I had to bring these children and their caregivers into my house. And at that time I didn't have carpet. And one of the little children sat in my lap 
and looked at pictures of my horses and we talked. And she told me that I had a beautiful house. Aww. And I thought, oh my, I've been carrying some ego around this. What she really needed, she got that day. Yeah. It's not, it's not about what I don't have. It's about what I can give. And I can give the love I have for the horses. I can give the knowledge that I have. Um, I'm careful not to let people, when I'm leading a group, ask too many horse questions. I always tell them I'll answer it at the end. I don't want them leading me off into, you know, teaching about horses. We're there to learn other things. Right. But I think it's important if they ask a question to answer it. Um, so I always tell them, you know, let's not interrupt somebody's process with a question. Be respectful of that. But in the recovery community, they mostly are because that's what they do in groups and they're used to that. Right. And they, and they help each other. So that, that's a very uh, rewarding um, group to work with. But, um, but yeah, they, they want to know about the horses and it helps them to understand. Yeah. Otherwise, the horses can wind up becoming tools instead of um, compatriots and um, sentient beings. Um, so I think that's a really important point that you just made, that you just distinguished um, for a lot of people um, coming into the field and also people that don't really know much about horses and what we do is the difference between a tool and a partnership like what we're trying to facilitate. Exactly. Because it, they're not paintbrushes for art therapy. Right. They are living biofeedback machines. And they will know when a person is not breathing when they're walking with them around the arena. And they will act differently. Um, I have one horse in English Mountain that will actually bump somebody in the solar plexus and I'll say, are you breathing? And they'll say no. And then they'll laugh and then she'll quit bumping them. I know. Is um, that, I just, I love horses and just how intuitive they are and how they communicate to us. It's just so remarkable. So I, it is, it is very different. And, um, I would tell people, you know, it's, they say, well, what do you do? And I said, well, it's like a ropes course. Only the ropes have an opinion. <laughs> uh, that's so funny it reminds me of a story that somebody told me once that was a body worker and they had worked on this horse and the horse had different issues and it got done working with the um the massage practitioner got done working with the horse and the horse's owner had recently had heart surgery and so um there is a scar in the person's chest and when the practitioner asked the horse, is there anything else that needs to be worked on? The horse gently um, put its nose on its owner's chest. Wow. Yeah. One really of the very first groups that we ever did. Mm -hmm. We had a horse go over and in, in the course of the group and the activities we were doing, walk over to a woman and put his nose on her tummy. And we got an email back. Who would have known that it would be a horse that would help me heal from having an abortion? Oh, God, that just sends like shivers through my whole body. Wow. It was unbelievable. Wow. Unbelievable. Oof. And, you know, so you never know what's quietly going on behind the scenes. It's true. Um, um, and it was powerful work. very, very powerful work because somehow they know where we hold the pain. Yeah, in our bodies, and they help us release that. And I, and I had to learn with the 
uh, groups, you know, that I was doing, uh, what the body language really looked like. I had a client one time and all we were working on that day was focus. And they, he was walking the horse from hula hoop to hula hoop. There were three hula hoops. And he looked like he was very, very intent. But the horse would not set one foot inside that hula hoop. And he looked focused. And I finally said to him, Charlie, what's going on with you today? And he says, I'm just all over the place. He was trying to hold himself together. Yeah. He wasn't focused. And once he admitted that. The horse stepped in the hula hoop. The horse stepped in the next hula <laughs> hoop. And he laughed. It's amazing. And, I said, and, 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 he, and he laughed and he got it. He really got it that he needed to be honest. Yeah, just being authentic and coming into congruence. It's amazing. Like they don't want to work yeah. with you if you're incongruent. Like they just have you everybody wants to be around a person that's authentic, that they can right. trust their words and their actions. And it is shockingly one of the most difficult things for people to do because there's so much vulnerability. There's so many masks that people tend to wear and so much they've been people have been invalidated and their self-worth is down and there's so much confusion. And so the gift of our industry is so much just being able to teach people how to be themselves. I had one client and, and of course I teach him, you know, that the horses have no agendas yeah, and that, that they come to you right where you are. And this one guy came back the next week and he said, you know, Pam, I really understand that. He said, because most people are really put off by my dreadlocks and my tattoos but the horses never have been. They treat me just like I am. Oh, they don't care what you look like. Not what I look like. And, yep. and, and I had another client that was right after that, that um, left and came back. And he looked at me and he said, I'm back because I didn't really get that authentic connection and, and I'm back to learn that. And, and, and he stayed and he stayed and he worked until he felt like he had it. So that's so fantastic. Um, Just like the honesty those are, there. Those are the moments. Those are the moments that, that make it all worthwhile. Yeah, absolutely. God, it's just when they get it. So, yeah. um, I, I never knew that's where I was going to wind up, but it has been very, very rewarding work. Um, the seeds we plant, we may never see come to fruition, but we know that we have planted them and, um, and the universe does the rest. It's true. It's like the story of the bamboo tree. You know that story, don't you? How you plant, you don't know the story of the bamboo tree? Let me tell you the story of the bamboo tree. It's a beautiful story. It's an old Chinese story about a man who goes into the woods and he's just totally frustrated with life. And he's just like, Ugh. he goes into the woods and he meets a hermit. And he's like, what's all this worth? Like, I've, I've tried to do all this stuff. I keep failing. Like, this, I can't do anything right. And the hermit takes him to a forest and he shows him a fern and he shows him a bamboo tree. He says that he planted the two seeds at the same time. And the fern seed quickly bloomed and the ferns unfurled. And he watered each daily. And for the first year, nothing happened with the bamboo tree. But still the hermit watered it every single day. And it was the sun and talked to it and it was great. The second year goes by still nothing. And the third year goes by. And again, the fourth. And in the fifth year of the hermit watering the bamboo tree, every single day, a small little start shows. And then all of a sudden, over the, over the course of, I believe it was six weeks, the bamboo tree grows 100 feet straight up into the air. Wow. 
And so over all the years and all the things that we learn and all the obstacles we have to overcome, it's the roots of our tree growing deep into the earth to support us when we finally get to hit that space and shoot into the air and be supported by the winds that blow us but don't break us. Beautiful, beautiful, and so true. Yeah. And so true. Yeah. We have our dreams and we put foundations under them. And if we're rooted in love, they always come to fruition. And we just have to have faith. And just um, patience and grace can be very difficult, but that does not make them unimportant. That's right. <laughs> so true. Well, oh. thank you so much, Alicia. I think we've accomplished a lot. I think um, we have too. If uh, people have any questions, they're always welcome to contact me. Um, thank uh, you so much, and I will put your, it. I'll put your contact information underneath um, in the description for the video, and so the video will be posted on Facebook. I'll be putting it on my site. Um, on my personal website and on Global Equine Affiliates. And then I'll be putting it on the YouTube channel for Horsepower Empowerment Through Connection. And I love that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Feel free to contact either one of us with any questions that you have about the field or what we do um, or where you think we might direct you with what you have going on in your own lives. And thank you so much for taking the time to watch us today. And thank you again so much, Pam. You are such a gift to the world and to our industry. And I just so appreciate the time that you've taken you, you to talk had, to today. You had one question on there that uh, you asked me, what inspires me? Yes, what inspires you, Pam? Right now, right now, it's people like you at your age that inspire me that I know that this work is in good hands. Thank you so because much. That means a lot. I'm, I'm in the, you know, the last trimester of my life and, and you're just blooming, beginning to bloom. <laughs> and it's, it's beautiful to see and it's inspiring and it's, and it gives me such deep, great hope um, that this work will always be in good hands. So thank you, Alicia. Thank you so much. <laughs> I'm like, oh, you're going to make me mushy. <laughs> thank you. I really, I, you're doing I really, great. thank you. Thank you. We just got to help change the world, you know, one person at a time, starting with ourselves. Absolutely. All right, my friend. Well, you have a wonderful day, and I look forward you to getting to talk to you soon. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Bye.